I mentioned earlier that uh, we have a rocket scientist with us. Arthur Pesa is a pioneer aerospace physicist. And I mentioned that I have seen his, some of his formulas which enabled man to get to the moon and back. And I can assure you that they're indecipherable to me like ancient Greek. Uh, but we're, you're going to have a chance to see that. And he has altogether had such a remarkable career that I'm just going to have to do a quick synopsis of just a few of his accomplishments. And further, when you see me reading here, it's because when you're dealing with rocket science, I have to read some stuff here, otherwise I won't know where I am. Now, with all those warnings, I'm glad you're here, Arthur. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, we're going to talk eventually about your remarkable aerospace career, but I want to start out with you're very remarkable. Now, may I ask your age? Are you 85, 86, 87? Well, I'm 84 at the moment, 84. but uh, well, I will you, be 85 soon. Well, you started out very young as a B-29 bomber pilot. Yes. Over China and Japan. And India from and India. India. Oh, That's now, right. let's talk about, here's one of the highlights I want to mention. Let's talk about the time when you and, what, a thousand other B-29s flew over Tokyo Yes. in one of the most memorable bombings, horrible bombings, of the war. Yes. April, May 19, 1945. It was May 24th and 26th, mm -hmm. yes. We destroyed, oh, more than 24 square miles of Tokyo on that, of on that pair of missions, that's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. How many uh, planes? Were there a thousand planes? Uh, well, actually, there were, it was a double mission. Mm -hmm. And the first wave was about 550, and then quite a few were shot down and had to stop at Iwo Jima on the way back, our emergency base. And then in the second wave, there were probably about 480. So the total in the two waves was a little over 1,000, 1,050. It destroyed much of Tokyo. Oh, yes. In, uh, in four total uh, missions, main missions, 58 square miles of Tokyo were obliterated. Now, this is a horrible comparison to make, but you mentioned it earlier that Tokyo was far worse than the combined uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, Yes, bombings. or Dresden and uh, Hanover and Nagasaki, This is Hiroshima. bigger than all of them combined. All combined would, would uh, be far less than Tokyo alone. And nobody knows how many people perished in Tokyo, and nobody seems to be uh, worried about how many there were. And when you were in, over Tokyo, you had to be extremely careful because the flames went so many thousand feet in the air that you could have been sucked into the flames. That's right. You had to take uh, certain action. Had to avoid the thermals, yes, mm -hmm. indeed. But of course, the sky was just filled with anti-aircraft shells exploding and planes going down, and it was a frightful experience. And you had to make an emergency landing in, in Iwo Jima on the way back, didn't you? Uh, well, uh, I think, uh, oh gosh, there was a total of uh, 50 or 60 landed at Iwo on the way back, yes. Okay. Let's move on now to 19, I think it's 1962, okay? You're with General Motors at that time, and you were very much involved in what the Thor missile, that was a very important phase of the Khrushchev-Kennedy uh, uh, debate, or standoff. Yes, that came later. Now, uh, we were uh, designing and building the guidance, uh, inertial guidance system for Thor mm -hmm. uh, back in 56, 57, 58, and finally uh, up to about 1960, we were t testing it out at Antigua uh, from Florida, from Cape Canaveral, and uh, so on. And so we finally broke the one mile barrier in which we could hit within a mile of our target a at 1,500 mile mi mile miles. Uh, uh, break a thumb. So we were the first. Thor was the first to. And then you uh, went on to Polaris as well that uh, permitted. Uh, yes. The, uh, this was a, an ingenious guidance system uh, designed by the uh, people at the Draper Labs at MIT, but we implemented you all of this. You were very much involved with that. Yes, and we implemented this at, at, in Milwaukee at AC Electronics, mm -hmm. and we uh, uh, designed and built the, uh, the gyros and the accelerometers and all of the electronics that went into this complex system and the gimbals and all that. And then later on after that, when we finished with Thor, we won Titan. Titan II was the first of the ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, which went 6,000 miles. And we, again, uh, had to do the designing of even more precise. Let's move on to space, moon, to the moon and back. 
and you were very, at, at the Honeywell Labs, you were one of the leaders in organizing the system, the guidance system that would bring the men to the moon and safely back. Yes, we, we worked on uh, systems on Apollo. We had actually uh, three control systems for not only the Saturn V launch vehicle, but the command module that went around the moon, and also the little lunar lander. Mm -hmm. We had uh, control systems, Honeywell designed and built the control system for all of those. And that was before shuttle, and then a couple of years later, uh, space shuttle came along and we won that one and so we had to do what we said we were going to do namely bring it back as an airplane. Now people told you, scientists told you, that there's no way that the space shuttle could come back into the earth, entry into the earth uh, in the form of an airplane mm -hmm. and you proved them wrong. That's right, yes. It was the, the well to this day a shuttle is the only uh, space vehicle that returns as an airplane. All the rest come in as a nose cone, which is melting and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's and so on. That's more primitive Yeah, that's very much mm -hmm. more primitive. And then they parachute them mm -hmm. in and so on. But uh, so uh, anyway, one of my memorable uh, occasions was when I, uh, uh, I delivered the paper to the AIAA, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, at Stanford back in August of 1972, in which I described our re-entry system for shuttle and uh, all of the... That was one of the highlights of your life. Well, one of the highlights and uh, all this sea of rocket scientists in front of me. I thought that, that they were going to question me deeply, but when I finished, they crowded around and congratulated us for having... It looked... We had lots of computer simulations, which... Uh, which proved that we could indeed bring it back and keep the temperatures such that the uh, that they would not burn up. And uh, some of these figures here uh, illustrate We're that be in graphically. We're showing those formulas. Yes, yeah, yes. right. Well, let me finish off by saying that since retirement, Arthur Pesa is by no means plateauing. He has another career. Uh, he has put out a number of books. One of them is entitled. The New Exact Small Arms Ballistics. Arthur is one of the foremost authorities in the country about dealing with, a, with small arms ballistic. It's a remarkable saga. And at the age of 85, 86, has he quit uh, writing and all this? No. He is just now published his most recent book, which is entitled New Exact Small Arms Ballistics. Arthur, this is an amazing life that you've led. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Arthur Pesa, rocket scientist.